Hello and welcome to the Michael Harding Podcast. I climbed Errigal once when I was a young fella. I was about 16. And I'm saying that because I'm actually looking at Errigal as I speak and the sea is behind me. So I think you can hear sounds in this. The sounds of the sea, the sounds of the wind. And I suppose I better apologise for the sounds on the weekend. I did a podcast, I thought it was going to sound like I was in the vault of a church and I thought that was going to be kind of atmospheric, but to be honest, you know it didn't work and now I know it didn't work. Sometimes you have to put a podcast up and and leave it up and then listen to it as a listener. And then you know how bad it is or how poor it is. It's a good way to test yourself, do you know. You go outside the door and you listen in from the the position that the listener is in. So I hope you don't mind the little bit of background noise again on this one. But it is the sea, the remarkable sea. And I'm I'm leaning on the edge of the the kind of sand dune so that I'm looking straight up at Mount Errigal, and it's very beautiful. And I thought I would do this first podcast just at the end of May, the beginning of June. I know the bank holiday is next weekend, but really tomorrow is the 1st of June. We're midway, the midway kind of month in the year, and I hope it's a good one for you. I hope you have a good time and you have your health. I'm pretty okay myself. I'm still struggling a little bit after time in Beaumont, but I'm doing fine compared to many people. And I'm I blessed to be standing here leaning against a sand dune and looking up at Errigal and listening to the sound of the waves behind me. I come here now as often as I can to the sea as often as I get to Donegal I come to the sea and it's a remarkable effect it has on me the sound of the waves I think for me the sea is like it's a different rhythm than my own you know it's like the way another person has a different rhythm They're, they're moving with a different heart beat inside them. The blood is circulating in their arteries and veins in a different way than in mine. And that makes them a a living presence. And when I see the sea, when I hear the waves, rhythm after rhythm, it's extraordinary how it feels like another presence and that calms me and it soothes me and one of the things it does too is I do often use it to meditate on the shortness of life because there's nowhere more intense when you're when you're walking by the ocean or the sea wherever you're experiencing something that will certainly go on not just after you have passed away but after thousands of years like that is remarkable and I know that I know that Donegal in the very north of Donegal above Inishow and there's the rocks and there would be nearly I think a billion years old or more a billion years old and there would be places in Donegal along the coast where the rock is 300 million years old. So yes, there's no doubt that the shape of the landscape changes around the coastline, but by God it goes slowly. And can you imagine little rocks, big rocks, 
monumental rocks that you have scattered around the beach here in Donegal. Can you imagine them? They were there 300 million years ago. I walk by this water and I feel humble. I feel lost in the presence of the ocean and the presence that I'm lost in is not one that gives me the slightest bit of anxiety. I mean like I could be lost in the presence of another human being and no matter how I would love them there would have to be anxieties flittering around in their psyche or mine. No matter how completely my love would be for somebody there's always something you'd be anxious about. But not with the ocean. You might be afraid of it. You might be scared of it if you were out in a boat. And maybe again that's why the beach is so comforting, you know. It's not even like a cliff. There's no danger that you'll fall in. Or like a friend of mine did when we were teenagers. Was swept in. He was 19 or 20, he had started college in Dublin and it was a winter and it was Donegal and he went walking with a friend and they were on the edge and his friend turned round and he was gone. He was gone into the waves and he never came out and nobody ever found his body which obviously broke his mother's heart. So you can be afraid of the sea. And I've been afraid a few times in boats. I remember going from Aran Moor one time as a teenager to the mainland, to Burtonport. And we were in a small boat. It wasn't the official ferry. It was a couple of lads were going and they said they'd give me a lift. And I got in foolishly to the boat and I realised, you know, they're all taking a certain amount of drink. And they were all high as kites, and needless to say, halfway over. Now there's a there's a, a gully, you know, a narrow strait of water runs between I think it was Inish Vicadoran and another bit of an island, or maybe it was the mainland, but there was a narrow passage which was like a bottleneck and that led into Burtonport. But it was before then, before then you were in the open sea. And halfway from Aaron Moore, sure enough, the engine conks out. And there's the boys pulling this ropey kind of lever to start it, and the boat not starting. And the smoke coming out of it. And I could see, because I was about 16 years of age and the lads were in their early 20s, and I could see that they were getting worried. And you'd be thinking, well, if they're worried, I should be worried too. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the boat motor started cranking up, and on we went. And did the boys admit anything? Did they say, like, oh, we should have never done that, we won't do that? Not at all. They just roared, laughing as if it never happened, as if it was just a joke. And on they went. And I got out of the little boat when we got as far as Burton Port, and I was glad to be alive. So there's definitely times when you would be afraid of the sea. And they have good reason, people around the coastline, especially the the fisher people, they've good reason sometimes to be afraid of it. And maybe that's why the beach is so consoling. Because you're safe. You're safe, and yet you're so close to the roar and the beautiful wild rhythm of the sea. And as I say, I think it's the rhythm of it. I think it's the fact that it comes like it's like out of a presence or a heart beating that's not yours, you know. It's the only thing. If you see a little 
puppy dog or a cat lying there and you see a little quivering going on on their skin when they're lying on their back or whatever you know it's their heart the only the only way that movement comes to us is a sense of a heartbeat and maybe that's why we think about that when we look at nature you know I'm looking at the moment now and the wind is wind is fairly unruly fairly boisterous wind here at the minute but I'm looking at buttercups the last day in May and I could count I would say 10,000 buttercups just in front of me and over the ridge there's about 500,000 more and when you're up close to them as I am at the minute they've a kind of a glossy inside to them and they have five petals and they're so beautiful little cups of butter for the bees I saw a bee today here too a solitary bee with a kind of a little red arse and a huge black back on him he was just black all the way and then a little tinge of red gorgeous colour never saw a bee like that before I have to say maybe I don't know as much as I should about bees so here I am looking at Mount Derrigal and thinking of the waves and I suppose the waves too got me thinking, you know, about how I'm full of anxiety. I mean, I know I am. That's why I come to places like this. That's why I live in a quiet and beautiful place in Nitra. Because I've always had the instinct that there's nothing soothes your anxiety more than nature and it's hard to find there's, there's loads of people listening and I know that you're in urban areas and I don't want to you know, feel like I'm saying oh it's wonderful to be in the country and you'd be listening thinking yeah it's well for Harding he can be in the country and do his job from there but I have to work in a city I know I know and there's, what can I say? I just keep trying to imagine that the world will, will, will preserve rural spaces and know that they are tabernacles of the sacred. Erigal there, a jewel, a jewel in Donegal, but also a kind of a, a tabernacle of what is holy. You can look at the the grey slate, you know, rolling down it. You can look at the very top where there's a little dip. You can sense something extraordinary, transcendent. And nowhere more than in those waves, in those waves, my God, behind me. Yes, I suppose that's it, my God, in those waves, my God. You know the way I often quote um, Patrick Cavanaugh who says to the blackbird, you and I are one of this, we lose our God at the set of sun. Well, I have to say, I lose my God on the edge of the sea, on the beach. You know, even the word God and, and all the prayers are an interference when you're at the sea. They're, they're a disruption of the intimacy that you can begin to evolve with the sea. I remember the story I sometimes tell about being out on a, an island in the west coast off Clue Bay and the priest was inside saying the Holy Mass and the people reading the Mass with him and me outside with the school teacher. This was many, many years ago. And says I to her, do you not go in to the church? No, she says. So when you're beside the sea, what need have you to go into a church? I was looking recently at, do you know your man Jordan Peterson? Now Jordan Peterson, I don't know if he'd be your cup of tea. He's very, very popular, particularly among, I would say, I think it's about with men. You know, 80% of his listeners on YouTube are men. And 
he gives a message that I think is very good for men, you know, it's very much about that, that you know, you, you should strive to do your best in life, you know, and, um, you know, make an effort to improve yourself all the time that you're alive. And that's a lovely message, good message, to be responsible, to be loving. And I was really sorry recently to hear that he had a... He wasn't well. Now, I don't know the details of it. You'll find him on YouTube and he'll tell you himself. But um, I think he had a bit of a, a stress breakdown. So he was on some kind of medicine to lower his anxiety all the time. And I'm not surprised because he was... By God, was he living in the fast lane for the past three or four years, going round the world with his books and and uh, doing lectures. I do get exhausted going round Ireland, you know. God Almighty, when I was doing tours and I do maybe 22 venues from Belfast down to Kerry, I used to think that's enough, like, you know. I need six months to recover. But those boys would be in Berlin one night and London the next and... Again, the size of the audience would be enormous. So, uh, I don't really know how he could avoid anxiety. There's a skylark now hovering. I can see him in the distance here. But he definitely got a very bad bout of anxiety. And uh, he was on this medication. And then he heard that the medication was dangerous because you could become addicted to it. And so he gave it up, and he gave it up suddenly, and then something else went wrong. And were it not apparently for his daughter and, do and son-in-law, who's Russian, and he was in Russia when this happened, I think, and he ended up in, in hospital in Russia, in Siberia. God, he had a tough time, you know. Sometimes you don't realise that, you know, the the big stars of television and all the rest of it. They're as human as you and me. And they suffered the same way as. They really suffered the same way from anxiety or ill health or whatever. We're all fragile. There's nobody there's nobody gonna make it beyond being human. If you could just rise to the summit of being human you'd be doing well. But that was the suffering of Jordan Peterson and he talks about it in his videos so you can find him and I suppose I would recommend him I think he's very interesting but there's a way I don't agree with him there's a way and you'd be afraid now to agree or disagree with Jordan Peterson because if you agreed with him there's a lot of people out there who kind of be annoyed with you and if you disagreed with him he'd be annoyed with you so it's like you don't go there and he talks about you know patriarchy and uh, postmodernism and neo-marxism and uh, really he has an, al an analysis of history that kind of is based on maybe saying that that marxism is a divisive, inherently a divisive idea. You know, the whole notion of a struggle against people against people, us against the ruling classes or whatever. And there's something in it, and I wouldn't be a scholar, but there's something in him that's like, he thinks is divisive, and then he thinks and feels that that divisiveness is, it, is an idea that's nesting inside all sorts of other things like feminism and that that has deteriorated the kind of academic and scholarly standards in universities because they're propagating an ideology. And I don't think he's against feminism, but he's certainly against what he calls identity politics, where the group becomes more important than the individual and he goes against that in a very persuasive way and that's not what I disagree with I'll tell you what I disagree with in Jordan Peterson 
it's actually his way of going on. You know? He has a way of going on which when he gets the idea of what's wrong with our culture he really grips it. He grips it so tightly that you can see him getting really annoyed and stressed about it, you know? And in a way to my mind he doesn't let enough space for the mystery of the universe to work itself out. I don't know if that makes sense. I'll give you a simple example. It would be this. Trump was there for four years and Trump might come back. Who knows? But he was there for four years and a lot of people would kind of agree that he was a malign influence. You know, he, he did it. The way that he made laws was divisive. Everything he did was divisive. Okay. Those people during the four years when Trump was there, and, and they get fierce annoyed. Oh, they get fierce annoyed about it. Like, they'd be stressed out. You couldn't talk to them at the dinner table. It divided families. People would get angry. And I understand that because when I was young, I was like that. I was... I have to say, sometimes, an awful bollocks at the dinner table. You know, I'd be so argumentative. The the beloved lady wife, she was she was the girlfriend at the time, we're talking 34, 32 years ago. But she used to have to give me a signal, you know. And I don't mean kicking me leg under the table that I probably would have ignored, but she'd have to put up the hand like as if she was stopping traffic and when I'd see the hand going up she'd say stop <laughs> and I'd know to shut my mouth and stop arguing because I loved arguing and I would argue till dawn especially if there was enough whiskey on the table or another bottle of wine was opened I loved it, I loved arguing and I would get into that sort of a grip where It'd be similar to what I'm describing about somebody like Trump, you know? Where people get into a grip and they get so distressed in the way that they're they're describing the horror of Trump, let's say. And, and, and the, the horror fills them. And then it's, it's almost like they're, they're poisoning themselves with the energy of Trump. Do you know that kind of way? And that's what I think happens with Jordan Peterson you know he has he's he's a ferocious scholar I mean he he is so on top of his game in relation to statistics and numbers and trends and sociological realities research mother of god he's amazing but at the same time sometimes he gets so kind of annoyed with himself intense with the argument that that you feel he's only, you know, he's only been poisoned by his own disturbed idea. And the classic example of that, of course, was the time that he was talking to Cathy Newman on Channel 4 News. And I was watching it that night live, and sure, the jaw would drop the way it was going. Talk about a crash. I don't know whether it was crash TV, but it certainly was a good crash to watch. Oh, Lord. She was there and it was like she couldn't believe this yo-yo. And he's there thinking, I can't believe this yo-yo. So those two yo-yos looking at yo-yos. And it was a classic example of what happens at a lot of dinner tables and a lot of pubs and a lot of conversations at the at the office, you know, where where people have very strong views and there's no way you're gonna change them. Right? Now, there's another example I give you just to throw it in for good crack, but you get the same in politics in Northern Ireland. Same thing, you know, where half the people have a whole set of ideas about the benefits of a republic and the need to, you know, move Northern Ireland forward towards a republic. 
and the other half have very strong views about the benefits of the United Kingdom and the monarchy and the Britishness of of being Irish and British and, and holding on to that absolutely. And you know yourself when that argument arises there's no talking to anybody. What I'm trying to get at in those examples is that we grip the world so tightly when we get into an argument it leads to anxiety and I think because I used to be like that and I hope to God I have improved a little bit but I think that the reason is I, I did something that that I wasn't doing you know back then I, I might have talked about belief in God although I don't think I did. I was in a, a dissolute kind of secular mood for about seven or eight years. But I certainly felt that I had to name the entire universe. I had to name the whole thing. I had to stay up till four in the morning explaining, explaining the world. And if there was something wrong, I had to be against it with it. Not just intellectually, but almost with a sort of a moral conviction that was emotional. And you get more of that now. More of, you know, people being offended, you know, by, by what somebody else is saying. Oh, I'm offended. And I've gone the other direction. I've realised as I get older that you can't control the universe and you certainly can't control the conversation and you can't control the ideas in somebody else's head. And if you just stand back and listen, that's when you get free from the argument. It doesn't mean that you believe any less what you believe. I mean, I have beliefs about relating to Donald Trump, relating to you know the United Kingdom or republicanism. I have beliefs about Jordan Peterson. But I may be wrong. I may be wrong, you know. I had very strong views about the church. Very strong. Particularly about John Paul II and, and the way that I saw him as a kind of a conservative, bringing the church into a conservative place. But I may be wrong. I may have been wrong about him. And I wrote, I wrote in one or two books about him, sort of saying in a way that I was sorry do you know what I mean? That, that that he created a church where there was no place for me. But that's okay. He might have had a bigger agenda. I cannot expect the universe to move based on what I wanted to do. And I, I really feel deeply that sense of maybe having been wrong about John Paul II as I get older. It's like I feel it's okay to be wrong about everything. That that would be that'd be one of the biggest discoveries I've made in life. You don't have to prove you're right about everything. Maybe I get that from my childhood. Maybe those ways in my childhood that educators undermined everything I was doing and so I constantly had to prove myself argumentatively, you know. And I couldn't dare or bear criticism because I felt it was undermining me and all that. Maybe that's the reason, I don't know. But I certainly feel that I've got a, a more relaxed place. And it's it's the sense that it, it's not a negative thing. When I say that I'm inadequate, you know, when I say I have failed, I don't mean it negatively. Let me try and really explain that. It's so precious to me. When I say... I was a failed teacher. I was, it was the first thing I tried and then I went on into social work for about 18 months and I, I kind of failed at that and then I went into the church and I, I made a right big failure of that in about three or four years. And Then I started writing books and in a way you could say I failed at that and then I, 
I did a certain amount of acting and I failed at that. So you could really describe everything I've done and say, well, sure, you know, you failed at a lot of things. And when I'm old, I will fail ultimately when I breathe my last breath. Because, and I love the phrase they use in Ireland, you know, about an old person or a person who's who's kind of had an illness or something and you'd say, how is Joey? And they'd say, ah, he's failed a lot now. He's failed, yeah. And they don't mean he failed his exam. They mean he's, he's kind of thin and, and gaunt and no energy in him. Ah, he failed a lot. Because it's a beautiful word, failure, and we all fail in the end completely. Completely. In the silence of the grave. There's the failure. Now, the reason I say that it's most important for me that's not negative. That's not a negative idea. Why? Because it's like, if I'm inadequate, it's like saying I don't f come up to the full measure. It's another way of putting it. I'm not perfect. I'm not complete. I'm not the full shilling. <laughs> I'm not the full bottle of whiskey. I'm not, I'm not the completeness. There's something else completing it. There's something else filling it. There is something else that is adequate. It's not me. And that's the waves. The waves tell me that. They tell me that, that my life will fail. But there's something makes it complete. There's something whispering to me. Even as I'm speaking to you, in my ear I can hear the sea behind me. Each wave whispers, I will complete you. Beautifully, gracefully, as the universe was meant to complete you. I will complete you. That's what I hear as a whisper in my ear from the waves. And so I know, not only is death not to be worried about, not only is death something that will be completed by the universe, my life will be completed. I don't have to worry that my life is inadequate, that my life doesn't come up to the mark, come up to the measure. I don't have to worry that I'm not perfect. I do have a role to play a role. I have a role. Because I was born and I didn't I didn't plan it. Someone brought me here, as Rumi says, and whoever it was will bring me home. And that sense of living in the sky as belonging in the sky, as part of the sky, as as just a tiny bit that completes the sky. And everything else has its place. These clouds in front of me, on the seagull that passed a few minutes ago, and the skylark that was there hovering, and they all have their place, and I have my place, but I am not the totality of the cosmos, really. I am not everything. I cannot be everything. And if there are trumps in the world, dictators, they'll come in their own time and they'll go in their own time. Really, the last thing I'd love to say as I'm here on the beach, leaning on a sand dune full of buttercups, looking up at Erigel, is to wish you a very happy month of June. May you be blessed every day for 30 days. And in your world, may you come to know that you don't have to be perfect or complete. You don't have to fill everything. You don't have to do everything. You don't have to be right all the time. You have your role to play. It was given to you as a gift. 
It's a mystery that you're here. Mystery that we're all here. Thank you for being here. Bye-bye.